Welcome to the study of God's Word with pastor and author Ed Taylor, recorded live from Calvary Chapel in Aurora, Colorado. To learn more about the many resources available through Abounding Grace Media, visit us online at calvaryaurora.org or download our free app on all platforms. And now, here's Pastor Ed to take us into our study. Amen. Would you please take your Bibles and open them to Hebrews chapter 6? Hebrews chapter 6, as we continue on in our verse-by-verse -verse study through the book of Hebrews in a Bible study that I've entitled, Patiently Waiting on the Promises of God. Patiently Waiting on the Promises of God. And as we're studying through chapter 6 in Hebrews, we're learning the beauty of the saving power of God. Where what God has begun, he is faithful to complete in your life. What he started, he's going to finish. And it's in the first eight verses of chapter 6 that this truth comes to life as a warning. We're warned to make sure that we're in the faith. We're warned to make sure that we're walking in obedience. Now I know that the first few verses of chapter 6 have become so controversial and everybody wants to argue about them. But oftentimes in the midst of arguments, the very essence of truth is missed. And we've studied, if you've been with us in our previous studies in Hebrews, if you haven't, you should catch up on them. We looked at the controversy, we came to a conclusion, and we rejoiced in the finished work of Jesus Christ in our lives. But for the sake of review, pick up with me in verse 1. Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works or of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms, or the laying on of hands, of the resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. <clears throat> for it's impossible for those who are once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and of the powers of the age to come, that, verse 6, if they fall away, to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. Verse 7. For the earth, which drinks in the rain that often comes upon it and bears herbs useful for those by whom it is cultivated, receives blessings from God. But if it bears thorns and briars, it's rejected and near to being cursed, whose end is to be burned. So the warning is, is to make sure that you're in the faith. That's the essence of the first few verses. Are you in the faith? Or are you born again? Or are you saved? Or like Paul would put it to the church in Corinth, you can jot it down in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5, he puts it this way. Examine yourselves as to whether you're in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless indeed you're disqualified. But I trust that you will know that we are not disqualified. And all of us need to know if we're saved or not. And the instruction is to test yourselves and to ask the hard questions. And the question today is, do you have Jesus Christ in you? You see, it's not enough just to say, well, I believe in God. And I'm sure as you've shared the gospel with folks that you have heard them say, oh, I believe in God. I believe in God. That, that's not enough because you need to define who that God is. You can't just say, well, I believe in God. I'm a very spiritual person. I do a lot of good works. No, no. Do you believe in God, the creator, who loved you so much that he sent his only begotten son to die for you, was buried and three days later rose again from the dead? Why? So that you might have the forgiveness of your sins. You know, of all the problems that people face today, the greatest problem they need to deal with is sin. Because it's sin that erodes and sin that destroys. And friend, the reality is this. The wages of sin is always death. The end of sin is not going to be a very pleasing experience for those who, that have rejected Jesus Christ. I know it's not a popular message in society today. It's not, never been a popular message. But to those who know Jesus Christ Personally, it's a powerful message, a life-transforming message. Do you really have Jesus in you? Have you repented of your sins? Do you have the witness of the Holy Spirit in your life, according to Romans chapter 8? 
Do you love the brethren according to 1 John chapter 3? Do you practice righteousness according to 1 John chapter 2? And I think those are good questions to ask ourselves. Good questions to review. Am I saved? And some would say, wait a minute, pastor. Is it even possible that I can know I'm saved this side of eternity? Like, is it possible that I can know today that I'm saved? And the answer is yes. Now, I know some of you grew up in a religious system that taught you that you won't know if you're saved until you get there. That's the worst time to find out. Because many people will stand before God and hear these words. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. Why? Because I never knew you. You can go through all the religious uh, motions that have been taught to you over the years and still not be saved. You could be sitting in this church, listening to this Christian radio station, watching on your computer and not be saved. You can desire the things of God. You can enjoy the things of God. You can own a Bible and a Christian t-shirt and a cross as a necklace and still not be saved. Jesus put it this way, you must be born again in order to see the kingdom of heaven. It must be a work that God does in your life. And in order to be born again, you turn away from your sinful past. You turn your life away from your sins and you embrace the finished work of Jesus Christ in your life. You can know. Here's what the Bible says in 1 John 5, verse 13. These things I've written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. You can know you have eternal life. Listen, The whole gospel of John. Now in the Bible, it's divided into two parts. The the, the first part we refer to as the Old Testament. And the right-hand side of your Bible, the newer part we refer to the New Testament. In the New Testament, it starts out with the book Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And these are known as the gospels. And they are three books of the Bible that chronicle highlights and episodes in the life of Jesus Christ, and they kind of overlap. They're known as the synoptic gospels. But there's a fourth book. It's known as the Gospel of John. And the main reason why the Gospel of John was written was so that those who read it would believe on Jesus Christ. That's why when you're sharing with people and you're talking to them about faith and you're talking to them about salvation, give them a Bible and tell them to read the Gospel of John. It's one of the books of the Bible that God uses the most to bring people to faith in him. You can know. You can be confident in your salvation. Notice verse 9 now. He makes a contrast to those that maybe were doubting or really going through and wanting to go backwards. He makes a contrast and he says, but you, beloved, we are confident of better things concerning you. Yes, things that accompany salvation though we speak in this manner. For God is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love which you have shown toward his name in that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. These are powerful verses. There are things that accompany salvation. Really what he's saying is, if you're a believer, we're gonna be able to see it in your life. There are things that accompany salvation. Look at some of the things that he mentions. First of all, he mentions that Not only is it better things, but he says, God is not unjust to forget your work. And so works accompany salvation. Secondly, labor of love. Again, on the the scope of works, you see people doing things motivated by love. Thirdly, notice ministry to the saints. That's where the church family comes together and you start serving one another. That accompanies salvation. And then in general, he says at the end of verse 10, just ministry or service. Your life, if you are born again, you will be a different person. Things will change in your life. And let me just say this. Salvation is a better experience than those that are not saved. It is better to be saved than unsaved. It is better to know Jesus Christ than to reject him. It is better to repent of your sins than to continue living in them. There are better things for you and me in Jesus Christ. That's a distinction. It is not better to resist Jesus. That's not a better thing. That's actually a worse condition. Let me put it this way. For those of you that have heard the gospel and those of you that understand the gospel and you say, Ed, what's the gospel? Well, it's very simple. Sin has separated you from God. 
what you might call mistakes or imperfection, God calls sin. And sin has separated all of us from God. That's our biggest issue. And the reality of sin in your life is that you now live a life pleasing yourself and not your creator. Some people have gone so far as to replace the creator with all fanciful philosophies and theories and all sorts of things that just eliminate the need for a creator altogether. Any moral responsibility or requirements are just erased in these fanciful philosophies. But no matter, it doesn't matter. Whether you acknowledge God or not, God is real, he exists, he created you and you're accountable to him. And the greatest response that you can have is to admit that you've sinned and to receive the forgiveness that's available from God. And you go, wait a minute, where did that forgiveness come from? Why, why would God forgive me? What is it in my life that I have to offer to God in order for him to forgive me? And that's a great question to ask. The answer is, you have nothing to offer God. All of your good deeds, everything you've done that might be good or might have any kind of merit or, or any kind of, of goodness attached to them, don't measure up to the perfection that God requires. And because of that, God took care of it on our behalf. And he sent his only begotten son, Jesus Christ. Perfection in human form. God met us. He didn't require us to climb up and meet him where he was. God met us where we are. And I have to say, some of us were a lot lower and deeper in sin than others. But nonetheless, we were all met by the love of Jesus Christ. It's an act of love for God's surrender on your part, God's sacrifice on your part. It's out of love. Jesus Christ came to earth and he lived for three, well, he lived for 30 plus years, but he lived the last three years of his life loving, serving, healing, feeding, and teaching us the way to be right with God. And what was his reward? A few people followed him, but most people hated him. And there was a small group of people that plotted to kill him and they nailed him on a Roman cross, an instrument of torture. And he died a torturous death. An innocent man. Didn't do anything wrong in his life. And they took him down off the cross and they placed him into a tomb and sealed it, thinking that they had done away with this man named Jesus. And yet three days later, Jesus Christ rose again from the dead. He's alive right now. He's alive right now. Energizing the very words of scripture to reveal to you his great love. It's hard to conceive, I understand. Some of you are listening to me right now and you just don't believe it. You just don't believe it. I remember sitting in a very same position that you were, sitting way back in the back and thinking, I just don't believe this thing about God's love. I don't believe it. I don't believe that God loves somebody like me. Maybe other people in this room, but as bad as I am and the things I've been involved in, and the things that, that I've done that have irreparably harmed people, I, I just didn't believe that God loved me. And yet I was constantly pointed to the cross. That's the proof of love. It's not whether you feel it. It's not whether you even personally experience it at the outset. It starts with faith. Believing what God has said. Do you know Jesus Christ, he rose again from the dead. 500 people saw Jesus personally, 500 people, who were mostly the 500 people, that means most of them would have been alive when the documents of the Bible were written. And they could have easily said, oh, that's a lie, that's not true. They say, I'm one of the 500 and I didn't see him, but no, there's no one ever in history that that was recorded. Not only that, but Jesus' best friends, we refer to them as the apostles or the disciples, 11 of them, because one of them committed suicide because of his, his betrayal of Jesus Christ. But the other 11, do you know that each and every one of them died a martyr's death, clinging to the truth that Jesus Christ rose from the dead? Not any of them at any time did they say, oh no, it's all made up. No, it's not true. No, they said, not only is it true, I'm willing to lose my life over it. My life is already hidden in Christ. And the good news is to you today, the good news is this, that if you acknowledge that you have sinned against God and you accept the free gift of salvation from him, the Bible says you'll be saved, that you'll be forgiven of your sins. You know, on one of the stops on our Israel tour at the end, 
It's usually the final stop. We come to a place known as the garden tomb. It's in the shadow of a a mountain or a little hill behind it that's known as Golgotha. And it has kind of a picture of a skull right in the rocks there. And the tomb, many believe that's the tomb. We don't know exactly what tomb it is, but many believe that's the tomb. And it has a lot of the things that would line up with the biblical, biblical account. And everyone on our tour, every time that we've gone there, we all stick our head in there or even walk inside. And you know what happens? We all find out that the tomb is empty. Nobody's in it, whether that's the tomb or not, whether that's the tomb or not, whether it's somewhere else and a lot of theories on that holds, it doesn't matter. Whatever tomb we look into that they say Jesus was in, he's not. He's now ascended into heaven. He's at the right hand of the father, ready to return according to his promise at any moment. Listen, it's imperative that you receive Jesus Christ in your life. There is no second or third or fourth alternative. You may have been taught growing up that all roads lead to God. And you interpreted that as well. Whatever path I choose, I'm going to end up at God anyway. Can I just say there is a partial truth to that? All roads that people choose will end up at God. But most people will be shocked and surprised that they chose the wrong road. And they ended up at God, the judge. You'll be judged for your rejection of Jesus. You go, I'm not rejecting Jesus. I just don't believe. Listen, your refusal to believe in Jesus Christ is rejection. You are saying that I hear what you're saying, Pastor, but I don't believe it, I don't accept it, and I don't want it for my life. And many people, even in the presence of Jesus, did the same thing and will pay the eternal consequence for it. But see, there are better things for you that are saved. It's a better life to be lived. I can testify that living for Jesus Christ is a far better life than I ever lived for myself. It's far better. And what he says here is I am confident for better things concerning you. And the only way you'll experience better things is by accepting Jesus Christ into your life. The better things are the, the, the new work that comes in your life, the transformed life. The greatest thing that comes from a changed life is now you are serving Jesus Christ. That good works are flowing from your life as a believer. You're moving on the things that accompany salvation. You're beginning to serve and obey. And it's interesting in verses 7 and 8 that the picture of a field is mentioned because it's We don't really think this way because the first century was primarily an agrarian society. And what that means is they worked the land. They had the land, they planted seed, they grew their own fruit, they grew their own stuff, they had their own animals. They basically took care of things themselves. We don't really live in a society like that. You know, we've gone from an industrial society to more of a technological and consumer-oriented society where, but still, when we go to Safeway and we buy an orange, you know somebody planted a seed, a tree grew, and an orange was produced. It was the fruit of that natural relationship of that tree putting its roots down into the ground and somebody took care of it. Somebody went out and picked. Somebody put it in a box. Somebody sent it to the market. That's the society that he's referring to. And one of the ways that God describes works from our lives is actually the word fruit. Would you turn to Galatians chapter five? This is a better thing that accompanies salvation and that's the fruit of God in and through your life. This is what God produces. You don't need to do these things. They come through an abiding relationship with Jesus Christ. This is the greatest change. Galatians chapter five, verse 22 After dealing with the works of the flesh and all the sinful behaviors, you can read that on your own starting in verse 16, but come to verse 22 with me and notice the contrast. He says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh and it's with its passions and desires. If we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. One of the first scriptures I was ever instructed to memorize was Galatians 5, 22, 23, and 24. To look for these things in my life. And some commentators believe that the fruit of the spirit is actually singular and everything else flows from it. And I can see that, that the fruit of the spirit is love. 
the agape love of God, and then everything flows from love. And I can see that. But notice what comes in your lives. Love, joy, peace, patience. The patience of God is yours. Kindness. You know, a better thing that accompanies salvation is you're a kinder person. You're a person that's more patient. You're a person that has the peace of God because you have peace with God. You're a person that's filled with joy even though it's, sometimes you're sad and yet you have the joy of the Lord. You're a person that manifests the love of God. Imagine that. These are things we take for granted. You've become a faithful person. Why? Because of God living in you. You've become more gentle. And notice one of the most underrated fruit of the Spirit is self-control. How much self-control is in this room right now because God lives in you. You know, a lot of times we take credit for the self-control that God gave us. So, well, you know, I didn't blow up because I bit my tongue, pastor. Well, stop biting your tongue. That's pretty painful. Just yield to the Holy Spirit and he'll give you the self-control that you need. And you won't be yelling anymore. You won't be punching holes in walls. Uh, you won't be trying to control things and, and all angry and out of control. Why? Because the Holy Spirit has given you self-control. And you're a better person because of God living in you. These are the things you're looking for. The fruit of God. It's not any effort on your part. But at the same time, believers are marked by their good works. Good works come from believers. And yet, we're not saved by good works. So don't confuse the reality that because good works come from your life, that that's the reason you're saved. No, the Bible makes it super clear that we're saved by the grace of God, that there isn't one of us that deserve it. Let me read to you Ephesians chapter two, verse eight. It says, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. This is where paying attention to the prepositions are very important. We're not saved by good works, no. We're saved for good works, yes. It's very important. Works are to come from your life. He says, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. James would put it this way in James chapter two, verse 14. What is a prophet, my brethren? If someone says he has faith but does not have works, can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food and one of you says to them, depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you don't give them the things which are needed for the body, what is that profit? Thus also by itself, if it does not have works, faith is dead. Saying you have faith, saying you believe in God, but have no corresponding good works that reflect the fruit of the Spirit is dead faith. It's where you need to test yourself and examine yourself whether you're in the faith or not. And one of the things you can look for is the fruit of the Spirit. One of the things you can look for are good works flowing from your life from God. Not your own thinking, but God inspires you to do good works in His name. It does no good to say that we have faith unless it's operating and in action. There's a world to be loved and reached. And the grace of God teaches us a true understanding of the grace of God teaches us that good works follow the believer. Alive, vibrant, a faith that's active. That we're not saved by, but for good works. Can I just say that the church, and I mean the church at large, of which we're included, the church has a lot to learn in the realm of grace and works. Really, much of the church today is so lukewarm, wishy-washy, having a form of godliness, but denying the very power of God. So many believers today settle for a low-level living, not really engaging the culture, not really choosing to live a holy, godly, righteous life, not choosing to follow Jesus Christ, not, not standing for what is right and what is righteous. The church today seems to be more spiritually compromised than ever before, morally asleep, practically fading away and becoming irrelevant because the church becomes like the world. 
And the world is looking for hope. They may not be able to communicate that. They may not be able to say, you know, I just don't have any hope. I don't know what's happening. I can't explain the way the world is going on. But deep down inside, they are separated from God and they're looking for stability and hope. And what do they find when they come to the church? Well, compromise. They find so much compromise and a church that's not willing to rise up and reach a lost and dying world. A church that's not rich in good works. A home in the block that's not rich in good works. We are saved for good works. This is not a theology of works, it's a theology of grace. That God is inside of us, working out His will in our lives. Notice In verse 10, I see another aspect here before we move on that's very encouraging to me personally. He says, God is not unjust to forget your work and your labor of love which you've shown toward his name and that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. This is encouraging to me because it tells me that God hasn't forgotten the works that you have probably long since forgotten. Like the life that you live for the Lord we can't possibly remember everything we've ever done for God. I mean, for example, what did you do on this day three years ago for God? You're like, man, I don't know. I don't know what I did last week for God. I'm just living my life. I'm just abiding in Christ and I'm loving my neighbor and I'm serving and I'm helping and I'm giving, whatever it might be. Like we're not keeping track of it. We're not keeping a journal of it. We're just living our Christian life. But I'm encouraged that even the things that I've forgotten, even the things that I don't remember, God has not forgotten. He hasn't forgotten what's happened in your life. Because you you might come to me, and this happened when we were even in Israel talking to someone. They explained a situation to me, and they could see on my face that I didn't remember it. I didn't remember it. And when I don't remember, I'll tell you, I don't remember. I'm sorry, I don't remember it because there's a lot going on in my life and a lot of people to serve and a lot of things happening and I don't remember everything. And it's okay that I admit that, but I'm encouraged that even when I don't remember, God remembers. He's faithful to not forget. And he, he ties it to justice. God is not unjust to forget your good works. The problem is, is that many times we attempt good works with the wrong motives. <laughs> and that's one thing in this room that I don't know for sure. I don't know the motives of your heart. I don't know what your motives are when you choose. I mean, let's be honest here. I don't even know my, the motives of my heart sometimes. I'm seeking and I want to think the best of myself, but I know, I know that my, the motives of my heart always, aren't always clean. God has to reveal my own heart to me and bring me to a place of repentance and say, no, Ed, don't do that. Don't do it that way. It's a great effort, but let's do it with the right motive. Let's do it with sincere love. And I say yes and amen whenever God reveals that to me. You see, Jesus put it this way. Let me read it to you in Matthew chapter 6. I want to read it to you from the New Living Translation because I love the way they put this. Listen to it. It's a fresh take. Jesus put it this way. Take care and don't do your good deeds publicly to be admired because then you'll lose the reward from your Father in heaven. Don't do good deeds so that people will admire you and look up to you and draw attention to you. No, he says, when you give a gift to someone in need, don't shout about it as the hypocrites do. Can you imagine that? Hey, everybody, look what I did this morning. I just want to let you know that. And you're actually shouting about all your good deeds. You're like, don't do it like that. That's hypocrisy. Because you're doing those works, what? In the name of Jesus Christ. You don't need to be shouting about them. Jesus saw it. He knows about it. He says, don't shout about it. Blowing the trumpets in the synagogues and the streets to call attention to their acts of charity. Now that's something funny to me. Can you imagine if we all said, okay, bring your trumpets to church Sunday and we're all gonna blow our trumpets. You you might've heard the the phrase to toot your own horn. It comes from this section. And here I'll start out. I was able to give. And then you go, wait a minute, I got a bigger horn than that. And we're all blowing our horns and blowing our trumpets. What we've done for God. And God says, don't do that. That's so hypocritical. What are you doing? What are you doing? I thought that you did that because I impressed it upon you and you acted in obedience and you did this in my name. He says, don't you be like that. And he says instead, but when you give to someone, don't tell your left hand what your right hand is doing. 
Give your gifts in secret, and your Father who knows all secrets will reward you. You know, that's something that we've truly attempted to adopt here in our church. So much flows through the life of this church in the realm of benevolence. So many other churches are blessed by this congregation. So many other pastors, missionaries, a lot of things go through. And on occasion, we aren't able to do it anonymously uh, because we'll have to write a check from the church or something. And we can't do it anonymously for the sake of accountability. And if I'm ever involved with something on that on a personal level, which sometimes I am, I always look the person in the eye and say this, hey, don't tell anybody where you got this from. Just give glory to God. Don't, don't say, you know, that it was a Calvary Chapel check or whatever. Don't, don't worry about that. If anybody asks, you just give all the glory to God because it's for God and it's from God and it's to God and how careful we need to be that the better things that accompany salvation, listen, one of the better things is there isn't one good deed here in this room, among us, on the radio, among believers, that God has forgotten. He hasn't forgotten. Even the things you've forgotten about, God hasn't forgotten. And the promise is that you'll be rewarded openly. I love that. It's so encouraging to me. So much time is lost and wasted trying to make a name for ourselves and drawing attention to ourselves so others will see what good givers we are or whatever it might be. But God sees it all, and it's to him. Now let me just say for a moment, some have taken this text and used the text in a way to say that we shouldn't express appreciation to anyone or they might lose their reward. I don't think Jesus is saying anything like that. I think the Bible is rich in appreciation and encouraging appreciation. It is a good thing, you know, it really is encouraging to someone when you say thank you to them. Oh, I know it's from the Lord, but God used them and you can say thank you. I think we should be generous in our appreciation. We should be able to say thank you for whatever it might be or I appreciate it or you really helped me and together you give glory to God. We shouldn't withhold appreciation trying to fulfill this because Jesus isn't talking about that at all. I think as believers, we should be the most generous in giving appreciation to people and thanking them for the faithfulness that they've been living and just give them the kind of fuel to go another day and to serve another day. I love this. God doesn't forget. Now, let's move on in verse 11 now. And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end, that you do not become sluggish, But you imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. And now he gives an example. For when God made a promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself. Saying, verse 14, surely blessing I will bless you and multiplying I will multiply you. And so after he, Abraham, had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. So in the life of relationship that Abraham had, He was saved by faith, just like you and I are. He was saved by faith. The Bible says that Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And so he was saved, but his faith led to action. And God used Abraham in a wonderful way. And God gave Abraham a promise. And that promise was in his old age, he would have a child and that child would be the, Abraham would be the father of many nations. And God gave him that promise. And as God gave him that promise, Abraham became a man that was greatly looked up to. As men would, as the Jews would look back on Abraham, he was highly esteemed. Most people thought, most people were taught that Abraham perfectly obeyed the law of God. Imagine that. Let me read to you a a note that was written in 200 BC in the book of Jubilees. And I'll quote it. It says, For Abraham was perfect in all of his deeds with the Lord, and well-pleasing in righteousness all the days of his life, end quote. According to the Mishnah and the Jewish traditions and writings of the day, people believed that Abraham was so perfect that he never had to repent of anything. So perfect. Now that's funny to me. Abraham, perfect, never sinned. Is that true? Well, how about let's interview Sarah. How about we ask his wife? Hey, how how perfect was your husband? Well, let me tell you a few episodes that are written in the Bible of how Abraham sold me out. Yeah, we know about those. I would consider those great failures. We could interview Ishmael and Hagar and what he did to Hagar. 
taking advantage of her. Abraham was not a perfect man, and yet his faith accounted him to righteousness. The same way it does with you. You're not a perfect man or woman. We don't need to interview the people around you. You readily admit you're not perfect. And yet when you believe, it's accounted to you for righteousness by the blood of Jesus Christ. It's an amazing exchange. See, Abraham is given now as an example of persevering faith. Because here's the thing as we close. When a promise comes, there's often a space between when the promise comes and when it's fulfilled. We often refer to that as waiting on the Lord. (laughs) So can I ask you a question? Have you ever waited on God for an answer to prayer? Anybody here? And you guys listening on the radio, you can raise your hand, but get it back on the wheel real fast. (laughs) Of course we have. Even for those of you that didn't raise your hand, you know that you've waited on God. That you've asked for something or you received a promise for God and it hasn't come to pass. I mean, I look back in the entirety of my life as a believer and there have been many, many things that I've asked for God and waited for an answer and sometimes I haven't been happy with the answer. The answer from God actually stumbled me and not because God stumbled me, because my own flesh did. It challenged my faith. Anyone that has ever waited on God has learned that their faith has been challenged. I think one of the issues, one of the issues that the Hebrews are dealing with is doubting God. That's why they're wanting to run all over the place for some sense of of comfort, some sense of stability. They are even willing to leave Jesus Christ and go back to religion and the comforts of religious activity to feel secure when all the while God has given them his best. He's given us his best in Jesus Christ. Whenever we're in a place of waiting, our faith is under attack. Because it's easy, let's be honest, it's easy to believe God and trust God when everything's going the way that we want it to go. When everything seems to be going the way that we expected. When things are lining up. And yet, like the Hebrews, when we're challenged and God gives us a promise. I mean, I look at my own life. God has given me a promise. And for six years now, I've been waiting for that promise to be fulfilled. I mean, six years is a long time to wait. And I don't know when it's going to end. And yet, God continues to strengthen me as even my own mind will undermine my faith. And I'll doubt God and I'll wonder what's going on. And I'll come to him in prayer with all my cares, like the Bible says. And I cast all my cares upon him. He receives our prayers. And he comforts us as as our kids. You know, there have been times when my kids would come to me with some hurt or some pain And I don't have the answer for them. I don't know what's going on. I just come alongside of them and comfort and encourage them. I can't solve their problem for them. It's something that they're going to have to grow through. And many times as kids of the Father, God has allowed these situations into our lives so that our faith would grow. And as you wait, it feels like you're becoming weaker, but the Bible actually says you're becoming stronger. That's what it says in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 29. The Bible says he gives power to the weak and to those who have no mighty increases strength. And even the youth shall faint and be weary and the young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength and they shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary and they walk, they shall walk and not faint. Isaiah 40 verses 29 through 31. Waiting is a place of strength. The in-between times that time between the promise was given and the fulfillment of that promise, that in-between time is where God does his deepest work in our lives. So what about Abraham? He was given the promised son. How long did he wait? For you Bible students, you know, 25 years he waited. And he was already the, already an older man when he was given this promise of, of seeing a child conceived. He was already an older man, very old. And he waited another 25 years. And don't you think, along the way, each year, successive year, it seemed more impossible than when the first of the promise came. As they know their own bodies, as they see it, man, it's just, this isn't going to happen. That's the whole reason why the situation with Hagar and Ishmael happened. They became impatient. 
And they only looked at the circumstances. And they only looked at the way their bodies were. And they only looked at their own resources. And they only looked at their own limitations. And they tried to figure it out. They tried to make God's will happen. And unfortunately, it caused great strain and grief to their lives that the Jewish people are still suffering from today as I speak. What about David? Another man that waited on God. David, he was anointed the next king of Israel by God. He was a young man anointed. The problem was, is that there was already a king on the throne. His name, Saul. And Saul was a very insecure man. And he was threatened by hearing another man was anointed king. And he chose to go after David and try to kill him on multiple occasions. Chased him all over the desert. Chased him, caused him to, to, be, to be in a place of running with all these men following him. And you know, David was given opportunity after opportunity to take things into his own hands. He could have taken Saul out. He could have eliminated his problem. He was even given the opportunity in a cave. And this is another place that we stop on our tour. We come to a place of En Gedi and we hike from the parking lot all the way up into this place where there's a waterfall and the temperature change is dramatic when you get back into the alcoves there. And you can see why he would hang out, as the Bible says, in En Gedi. And while he was in that area, Saul was relieving himself, the Bible says, in a cave. And David was there and they whispered to him, now's your chance, take him out. And instead he cut, he cut a little piece of his robe off and he came out and says, I want you to see, Saul, I could have done it, but I chose not to, hoping to see peace. But he didn't experience peace, it just got worse. Saul never let up. And yet David chose to trust God while he waited. It was no little waiting. It was no soft thing. It was very hard, very difficult. And the choice after the choice after the choice in David's life was not to take things into his own hands, but to trust God. If God said he would be the next king, then he would be the next king. And that's the thing. God gives the promise, but he doesn't give the timetable. <laughs> We're so... We hate that. I don't know about you, but I hate that. The timetable. For the Hebrews, the promise was Jesus will return, but he hadn't come yet. And it caused all this stuff in them, and that's why the book of Hebrews was written. Listen, church, it's important that we learn, like, like verse 15, that we patiently endure. And this is, if you'd like to write in your Bibles, you can circle work, the word, the phrase, patiently endured. Draw a line back to verse 12 and circle the word sluggish because these are two opposite responses. Because while you're waiting on the Lord, you could become lazy. Now, I don't know many people, there hasn't been many people in my life, I'm not gonna say none, but there hasn't been many people that admit to being lazy. So you're just a lazy person. The first response, I'm not lazy. And you start looking at all the things you do. But this isn't a practical laziness. This is a spiritual laziness. And the reason why the condition of the church and the world is the way it is today is because many believers are just lazy. And you know with laziness, we all choose to do what we want to do. We always make time for what we want to do. And the warning here is don't become lazy. But have the same diligence of full assurance, and like Abraham, patiently endure until you receive the promise. I know God hasn't given you the timetable, but he's given you the promise. And God is the great promise giver and the only perfect promise keeper. And he keeps all of his promises. And when things are outside of our control, when things look bad, when things feel bad, when things seem bad. Listen, when things are bad, we must learn to hold on to the promises of God, to memorize them, to repeat them. We'll get to this in our next study, but jump down to verse 18. Really, let's read the whole sentence in verse 17. Thus God, determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise, by the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things in which it's impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope that's set before us. Let me read it to you in a more modern translation. So beautiful, so encouraging. 
It says, so God has given us both his promise and his oath. And these two things are unchangeable because it's impossible for God to lie. Therefore, we who have fled to him for refuge can take new courage for we can hold on to his promise with confidence. Listen, this confidence is like a strong and trustworthy anchor for our souls and it leads us through the curtain of heaven into God's inner sanctuary. God can't lie. And so his oath and his promise stand true. So hide God's word in your heart. Hold on to the promises of God. They'll encourage you. They'll strengthen you. They'll remind you of God's overriding sovereign purposes in your life when things get tough. And let Abraham's testimony be your testimony and mine, that he waited patiently. He waited patiently, or it says he patiently endured, and he received what God had promised. Isn't that so good? His promise and his oath. God is faithful, even to those of you waiting today, the in-between time. It may not feel like it. You may not even want to acknowledge it, but God is faithful. Even when we are faithless, God remains faithful. So Father, as we turn and learn how to patiently endure, and we're learning from the Hebrews so many things about our own hearts and our own lives, so many things that we share with our brothers and sisters from generations past that we begin to doubt and we begin to wonder. And then we start veering off over here and going over there and, and maybe just in our minds we start to doubt you, God. And I even pray right now, I just sense in this room right now that there are those that are, they would say that they're mad at God. And I pray for them, God, because that they've gotten to a place where they're just so hurt and so beat up that they think it's all about you. And I know you hear them, and I know you receive them, and I pray you'd bring healing into their lives. That you're the God of all comfort. And we, we know that. Like, that's something we know, because your Bible says it. But I also ask that those that are mad with you right now would feel your comfort. And I mean, how would we ever understand your comfort unless we were hurting, Lord? So I just pray that you would, I just release your comfort into this room, Lord, that by faith, men and women, boys and girls would receive it. That they would acknowledge their hurt before you and receive your healing, that you're a man of, Jesus, it says you're a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. So you know, you're like, you said earlier in Hebrews, you're our high priest that sympathizes with our weaknesses. And I pray for some among us today that have need to hold, they need to receive the promise of salvation. That's where they are today. That you have brought them to this moment. The very promise that they need to enter into the better life is to receive the forgiveness of sin. And so as we're praying, if you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, and the real promise is, that you need to embrace is the promise of forgiveness that comes through Jesus Christ. I'm gonna ask you, if you're here today, would you just stand to your feet? I wanna pray with you. You'd say, Ed, I need to get my life right with God. I wanna follow him and I wanna receive the free gift of salvation. I want, I want my sins forgiven like you mentioned. Just acknowledge that today and stand to your feet. I wanna pray with you and I wanna help you communicate with God on this very important day. And of course, you guys on the radio and you guys watching online, it may be in another part of the building here in the overflow, you're included. Even though we don't see you, God sees you. And this is the day that God has captured your heart and your attention. But for the sake of us here today in this room, today is the day of salvation. And if you're here today and you say, Ed, I need to get my life right with God, that's where I'm at. Would you respond? Just stand to your feet and, and allow yourself to be in a place of surrender today. That this is the time. And this is the place. Isn't it amazing to think that God's love for you, God bless you. And I mean that when I say that. I mean God's blessings upon you because of the decision you're making today. Who else would say that's me? Because here's the thing, the Bible says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus 
and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And we want to invite you into that place today. God bless you. Bless you as well. Just God is working in the room. He has in every service in our church family. I know it's a humbling thing. I know some of you might even be wrestling like I was when I got saved. I didn't believe God loved me. I just didn't believe it. It wasn't that I didn't believe God loved. I just didn't believe he could love someone like me. And I know my story is unique, but it's my story. And my life was so bad, and I had hurt so many people, and I had wrecked so many lives, that I thought I was beyond repair. And yet God was able to penetrate even my own mind and show me the source of love, and that's the cross. I didn't even have to feel it. I just needed to believe it. And so are you here today expressing your faith and your belief? Even those of you uh, on, online or on the radio, pray with me because I want to lead you in a prayer. Prayer is just talking to God. And you can repeat after me. You can use my words or you can use your own words, but stick with the path that I'm going. Okay? So you could say something like this. Dear God, I admit that I've sinned against you and I ask you to forgive me of all of my sins. Not because of my good works, but because Jesus lived for me and died for me. And Jesus rose again from the dead to forgive me of my sins. And I dedicate my life to following you from this day forward. And I need your help, God, to turn away from my sinful past and leave it behind me. And I receive your forgiveness of my sin through the blood of Jesus Christ. And Father, I know anyone, anywhere that prays that prayer or talks to you sincerely, you meet them where they are and I pray that the real deal is happening among us. I pray that you are changing lives right in front of us and that you would indeed bring blessings on them because you said anyone that comes to you, you won't cast them away. And so we see men and women coming to you today, coming to you last night, and we know you're not going to turn them away. But there's a battle that's taking place for their very soul. And I pray you'd give them the strength that today you would pour your life into them and they could say without a doubt that Jesus is in them. And so thank you for allowing us to be a small part of the big work you're doing in their lives. In Jesus' name. Amen. We pray that you've been encouraged by this Bible study delivered live from the sanctuary of Calvary Aurora. For prayer or a copy of this study, call us at 877-30-GRACE. That's 877-304-7223. Or visit us online at calvaryaurora.org. Be blessed as you worship Jesus this week 